DNA usually is depicted as this double helix, of which you have heard. And there is a lot of DNA in every single cell. Now, DNA is extremely precious because it makes every single organism. It is the, the blueprint, if you like. This is really hot stuff, if you like. It might not look like it, but it's absolutely essential. It's crucial. If you mess with DNA, you really screw up the organism. So therefore, this DNA, see it like as, a, as an extremely valuable book. Now, let's say you go to the library and you say, I want to borrow the book from, let's say, written by Henry the, the Second. So what does the librarian do? They say, oh, here's the book, yeah, uh, I, you can borrow it for three days, I'll just make sure you bring it back. Is that what the librarian does? Yeah? Oh no, definitely not. They won't give you that book, this precious book. They will say, you are, don't even think about it. You are not going to touch this book. Because it's so precious. You just mess it up. You have your, your nose picks on it and uh, you pour your coffee over it. God knows what you're going to do with that. So do not touch this book. Don't even think about it. But, you know, if you, if you have some persuasive skills, you can say, actually, I don't want the whole book. I just want, uh, say, three, four pages of this book. And then the li librarian might say, okay, what I can do is I can photocopy some of the pages. Obviously, with such an old book, they wouldn't do that. But, um, you yeah. know, if it's not that old, uh, then they can do photocopies. And that is exactly what the cell does, because DNA is so extremely precious. You don't mess with it. So, in order to work with the information that's there in your DNA, the cell makes copies of it. So it almost does a, does a sort of a photocopy. This is called transcription. And it produces another, similar to DNA, another molecule. This time it's single-stranded. It's not double. It's just single. And this is called... Anyone? It's called an RNA. This RNA is just sort of like a photocopy of something, of the information. It's all there, the information. Now, of course, you can't... If that was a sort of an instruction of building a car, here is the blueprint, the DNA is the blueprint, the, M the, the RNA is just a photocopy of that. Now you can't build a car from the photocopy, can you? This RNA actually is, tells you then um, what you need to do in order to build a car. So it says basically take a sheet of plastic, Take some metal, form the metal into something that's useful, that looks like a motor. And that's exactly what the cell does. The cell reads this instruction and uses building blocks. These building blocks are called amino acids.
And from this information, it builds the car. The, sorry, no, it builds the, the building blocks of the, 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 the units of the cell. So amino acids, and this process is called translation. And these building blocks, these amino acids, are put together. And we have about, we have 20 different amino acids, which occur naturally. And these 20 amino acids can be arranged in different forms. So, for example, we can arrange the amino acids as, let's say, A, B, C, D, E, A, D, G. So the different sequences, yeah? And each of these sequences has a specific shape. And it's the shape that's really important. With this, you will agree with me that shapes are incredibly important. When you just simply go into the uh, cafeteria, today I had lunch there, um, I'm still alive, and unfortunately I couldn't find a decent fork. They had knives, they had spoons, but try to eat chicken with just a knife and a spoon. It's interesting. It's the wrong shape. Likewise, have you ever tried to eat noodle soup with chopsticks? It's the perfect diet. Right? You, don't, you just simply don't get any food on it, on the chopsticks, especially not noodle soup. So you have to have the right shape. And this shape is defined by the sequence of these amino acids that are put together. Does that make sense? Yeah? So, for example, these things, these amino acid strings, they are also then called proteins. And the important thing is they have to have the right shape. Not the right shape the protein might not be functional. And you can't do anything with it. We see sometimes, or very often actually, that there are sort of hiccups in the system. So for example, if I have A, B, C, D, then it gives me this shape, which looks reasonable, but if I have A, C, C, D, then I might end up with this shape. Just a change in one of these amino acids can completely screw up the whole thing. These changes, you know what they are called? Fantastic. Who said that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. They are called mutations. And these mutations can actually happen spontaneously. In fact, are mutations bad? No? Why not? I'm, I'm, I'm getting really hard of hearing. Say again loud. All the evolution happens through mutations. You probably will agree with me that I look different to Simon. I look different to Jackie, right? They look different. Why? Because we are still humans. <laughs> we are still humans. 
So the big picture is still there, but we have lots of different mutations. That's why we look different. Right? That makes sense in the, in, in the first place. Okay, so that is sort of the, what shall I call it, the foreplay um, to <coughs> the viruses that I want to discuss with you. Right. Now, the first virus, let's go for the Zika virus. You heard about Zika? Yeah? It's uh, lots of uh, press news and things like that. Um, when was it discovered? Zika virus. Sorry? When? And where? Months ago in Brazil. Yep. Mm. Good answer. Like that. Was actually discovered in 1947 in. Uganda, in Africa, right? Now, your answer is perfectly all right because it was only brought to the, to the attention of people when people discovered that there was a correlation in Brazil between the Zika virus and uh, mis- uh, or deformations in newborn babies. They have this freaky, freakishly little head. So far, we assume there is a link between Zika and these birth defects, but we don't know for sure. We know that since 1947, when it was detected, the virus has spread to the South Pacific and it has spread throughout Africa and in, uh, in America. <coughs> we know that. In these parts of the world, however, no birth defects have been recorded. Could be because the medical system in some uh, African countries doesn't record uh, events like that or, or other things. Could be that this Zika virus doesn't do anything or hasn't done anything dramatic. Could be. So how does this Zika virus actually work? Phil said we do the life cycle of a virus, but it's a little bit uh, uh, of a tricky thing because people argue whether viruses are alive. Some people say they are not. Other people say they are. So we are not quite sure because they lack certain characteristics of life. Anyway, what does the virus do, actually? Let's say we have a human cell here. Just one cell. Now this virus finds a specific structure on the cell. And the cells are covered in different structures, in different proteins. Now here, let me do that in a different color. Now here, this virus attaches itself to these specific structures on the cell. It's almost like a lock and key mechanism. Then the virus gets pulled in into the cell, like that. And in the cell, it gets undressed. It's sort of virus porn. So this outer sh 
shell of the virus is removed. And what is left of the virus is actually the genetic information of this virus. The genetic information of this virus, however, is not DNA. That makes it really alien. Because we said earlier that all the genetic information is really DNA. But not in the sky. In this virus, the information is RNA. How weird. How alien this thing is. But with the RNA, the virus can do something absolutely amazing. It can hijack the system in the cell that usually uses RNA and make proteins. The cell has a very elaborate machinery to do that, from RNA into proteins. So what the virus does is it uses this system and it makes, instead of cell proteins, it makes lots and oh let's let's take this color it makes lots and lots of virus proteins so these are the virus proteins now these virus proteins can now assemble and build a new virus again. One problem remains, and this is we need to get more genetic information of this virus so that we can put this genetic information, this, this mRNA, back into our newly built virus. So how does that work? Well, actually, the virus is using this RNA strand, and I'll draw it a little bit outside here. So this RNA strand, and it makes, again, a copy of this strand, like that. Now this strand here, the green one, that the virus has, usually, is called the plus strand. And the red one is called the, this is the minus strand, exactly. So it uses then this minus strand to make lots and lots of copies, again, of the plus strand. And each one of these strands then is put into a new virus. So we have lots and lots of new viruses in the cell. And each one of these viruses gets its own RNA strand has the information for the next generation of viruses. What happens next? What do you guess? What do you reckon? What could... the cycle Sorry? The cycle, repeats the cycle repeats itself. There are so many viruses built in the cell that the cell will explode. Boom! And the viruses are released. Can you figure out what happens? Virus infects. Next cell. 
hijacks the mechanism in the cell, <laughs> produces more viruses, produces new RNA, produces lots and lots of viruses. Boom! Cell explodes. Does that make sense? Oh, shoot. All right? You are just one big walking virus that's left. I don't think that's very nice, but um, this is how it works. This particular step here that I highlighted here is actually uh, where, the, where the, the strands are uh, multiplicated, and this minus strand is actually... Uh, produced by um, a special protein which is called polymerase. And if you want to be really specific, it's an RNA polymerase. But don't worry too much about that. I just uh, want, to, want you to think about it. This RNA polymerase actually comes from the virus. It's one of these virus proteins. Humans usually don't have this polymerase. Here's a question for you guys. If you want to find a drug against Zika virus, what could you do? Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah, good thinking. So, you could stop this polymerase, right? And you could develop a drug that specifically stops this RNA polymerase. What would happen? It, well, you reproduce any more information. So, uh, exactly. If you stop the polymerase, the virus can't build this negative strand, which is required to make the positive strands again. You have a drug, right? Would this drug be dangerous to humans? Yes, They have RNA, but they don't have this RNA polymerase. So if you make it very, very specific for this RNA polymerase, it will only target the virus, but not human stuff. It's perfect stuff. Perfect drug. This is what actually scientists are currently doing. Yeah? Could you think of another way how we can stop the virus from getting into the cell? Stop it from, well, you could, I don't know, put something around the cells or make the cells do something else or um, use, build different um, proteins. So yes, yes, yes. What we can't, what we probably can't do is we can't change these bits here that are sitting here, right? We can't <laughs> change them because the cell has them. But what we can do is we could um, put some sort of a cap on these cells, on, on these, on these sticky-outy things. That was a very technical term. Right? It's almost like you put condoms on, on these spiky things. Now the virus can't bind any longer. And you can do that by finding proteins that really interact very tightly with these spiky things then you mask it, and the virus can't see it anymore. This is exactly what scientists are doing at the moment. Yeah? Okay, let's have a look at another virus. 
also rather unpleasant. This is the HIV virus. The HIV virus does exactly the same thing as the Zika virus. So here is the cell. The cell has these, what is called, receptors. The HIV virus binds to it. Exactly what we had before. But the HIV virus is even... What's the word? Even nastier. The information of the HIV virus is a double strand, but it's not DNA again, it's alien. It is a double stranded RNA. Now the virus gets transported into the cell, or rather, in this case, what happens is that the virus just simply releases the RNA into the cell. In the cell, again, it hijacks the protein generation mechanism makes new proteins, makes new virus proteins, and then it does something really nasty. It converts this double-stranded RNA into double-stranded DNA. Again, with a special, with a special um, protein, which is called reverse transcriptase. Now you have the information for the virus in DNA. And this DNA, that's where it gets interesting, this DNA jumps into your own DNA. So this is your own DNA. And now the virus places itself in your own DNA. And it does that more or less randomly. Now, this HIV beast is now part of you. And it waits. It waits. It waits till the conditions are good to break out. Sometimes the conditions aren't good. Sometimes you know that there is something and your body would fight this <coughs> infection like it would fight a sicker infection. But this HIV virus has all the time in the world. It's not going to kill you now. It's not going to kill you tomorrow. It will come out when the time is right. And you are screwed. And only when the time is right will the virus produce again RNA. It doesn't have to explode. It produces the RNA. Every now and then it will release a couple of viruses which infect other cells. And in two years' time, five years' time, 20 years' time, all these cells are destroyed. There's nothing left. And that is when you die.
job. Does that make sense to you? Yeah? HIV is really nasty. Okay, now we've talk, talked about all these nasty things. So, how can we actually fight against these horrible things? Against viruses? Against bacteria, for example? Bacteria are all around us. And they are trying constantly to win, to infect us. So how can we actually fight these things? Well, the body has a fantastic system, which is called the immune system. And, for example, when the body encounters a bacterium, so here's a bacterium, and these bacteria, again, have things on their surface. So little sticky out bits. Yep. These little sticky out bits Sit there, there are proteins, again, and let's assume this thing goes into the cell, or it goes into the body. We have very, very good protective mechanisms. We have the skin. It is a very, very strong barrier. We have an environment on our skin that bacteria don't like, but sometimes they get in. So what happens in there? One way of dealing with that is if this bacterium goes into the blood in the blood there are things patrolling these things very often they are sort of Y-shaped and they are called antibodies These antibodies have a very, very special sort of end. And these ends can exactly recognize these sticky out bits. So what could happen is that here an antibody binds exactly to these sticky out bits. And there are lots of these antibodies around, usually. And they bind to the, the bacterium. Now what happens then? Well, if a cell discovers that there is something weird and strange, with things sticking out where antibodies sitting on top of it. What this cell can do is it will actually eat the whole thing. Yeah? This is called, because it's so big, Big in Greek. What's big? Haven't you done any Greek? <laughs> Macro. And what means eat? Phage. Thank you. A macrophage. This thing is a macrophage. It eats the bacteria. But this macrophage does something even better. It eats the bacteria. So this is now our macrophage. It has um, 
swallowed the bacterium and it gobbles it up. Yum, 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 yum. It breaks it down. And then it puts bits of this bacterium <coughs> on its surface. So it produces these bits on the surface. And these bits on the surface attract other cells. And these other cells, they see, oh, wow, cool. There is a bit sticking out. Can I quickly? Yeah. There's a bit sticking out. <laughs> hey, yeah, cool. Hey, I know that this bit isn't yours. This actually comes from a bacterium. So, these other cells see this, that this macrophage is presenting what is called parts of the bacterium, and this is called an antigen. It's presenting them. Hey, look, I've got an ear, which is not mine, that comes from a bacterium. Right, look, I've eaten something that's been infecting us. Not good. Hey, guys, come here. Have a look. This is what an ear looks like. This is what the bacterium looks like. Right? So, you guys here, you find other ears. And if you find these ears, these parts, which belong to the bacterium, you shoot them. <laughs> right? Every time you see an ear, shoot it. Okay, you might kill me. Rip. But you kill all the others that have an ear. That is how the body gets rid of bacteria. It also, <laughs> it also trains some other cells. So let me draw another cell here. These cells then know what an ear looks like, and they can produce, again, these antibodies. So the antibody then is produced by these cells. They are called, actually, plasma cells. They are plasma cells. And these plasma cells produce more antibodies. And the antibody goes around and says, um, Hey, cool, there's an ear. <laughs> Amen. It's dead, right? You see how the immune system works? This is just a little bit of an overview. There are lots and lots of other systems. What could... What could a bacterium do to evade the immune system? Yes, 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 go on, go on. Yes. Is a yes, yes, exactly. So the bacterium, instead of, that's my feeble attempt of an ear. You see why I need your help, right? Exactly, yeah. Instead of an ear, 
it could present something that looks completely different. It could present something that, or have something, that looks like a body thing. That's what you said, yeah? It could look like, let's say, a nose. Now the immune system would get completely confused. So, with this, the bacterium could evade the immune response. Now, in order to help the body to overcome bacterial infections, bless you, thank you, yes, um, it's probably just a cold virus, but um, um, we have found a lot of substances that you could take if you've got a body uh, full of bacteria. What are these substances called? Antibiotics. Antibiotics, exactly. Antibiotics against, uh, resistance against antibiotics. Now these antibiotics, what they do is they target certain things on bacteria. So, for example, we might have a bacterium and the antibiotic makes holes in the bacterium like that. So it's like a, a leaky bin liner and everything goes out. How could the bacterium make this antibiotic not work? What do you reckon? Come up with some ideas. Sorry? It could put a shield around it. Exactly. Yes. That the bacterium, that, that, that the antibiotic cannot get through. It could, what else could it do? If you think of the ba uh, bacterium of the wall as, let's say, wood, right? And the antibiotic drills through the wood. How could you protect yourself from this antibiotic? Absorb it, yes, potentially. We could do that. Come back to the wood. Is wood hard or soft? It's pretty soft, isn't it? Yeah, I can do it with my, I can cut it with my fingernail. What could I do in order to protect me from that? I exchange the wood for metal, for steel, right? I could, I could modify the target. Coming back to our virus, where well, we said we have this polymerase, yeah, specific polymerase. We have a drug that blocks this polymerase. What could the virus actually do to make this drug inefficient? It could change the method so it doesn't use the polymerase. <coughs> Very good. Yes, that is something that happens. Or it could modify the polymerase so that the drug can't bind anymore, can't affect it. So modifying the target. Yeah, make sense? Now, these are just a couple of mechanisms that help bacteria to overcome these antibiotics. Here's another one. Um, sometimes what you can do is you... So this is our antibiotic here. The bacterium could...
develop a sort of something to destroy the antibiotic. Yeah? So it sends something out that kills the antibiotic. And the bug says, hey, hey, yeah, me win. So there are different ways. But why, what is the problem with antibiotics? Well, yeah? Why? It's already prepared for, yes, exactly. Yes? And what we find is that we have billions and billions and billions of bacteria around. So, loads and loads of different bacteria. These bacteria are all different from each other because they have mutations. And it could very well be that this bacterium here has developed the shield protection. This bacterium has developed something that kills the antibiotics. This bacterium, for example, has developed something that uses a different polymerase, for example. Yeah? All these bacteria have developed different approaches. Now, let's say I have a new antibiotic. And this new antibiotic um, attaches or blocks something in the cells that is located in here. Let's do it like that. So new antibiotic, that's my new antibiotic here, and it will block all these things here. What happens? It will kill the cells with this green blob in it, right? What happens to the one that doesn't have the blob? It won't necessarily learn from the mistake, but it will be spared. Yeah? Does that make sense? It does not necessarily know what's happened to the other bacteria. It just realizes that, hey, the others are dead. I'm alive. How cool is that? Hey, I'm no longer in competition with these other buggers. I can now get all the food. So what will this red bacterium do? Hey, let's bonk. <laughs> let's multiply. Yeah? And actually, what you do is you create what is called selection. You select for these bacteria who are not affected by this antibiotic. Just like natural selection, like the environment. It's Absolutely <laughs> right! Yes! Say again, loud! Uh, just like natural uh, selection, like uh, Africa or like the jungle or something, natural, but uh, uh, it's basically the same thing, but bacteria. Absolutely right! It's natural selection. The one that survives, it's surviving of the fittest. But here comes something really bad. These cells have died here. Yeah, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Dead as well. But the information, how to use a different pathway, is still around in the environment on the DNA. How to build an efficient shield is still around in the DNA, isn't it? The cells are just dead, but they still have the DNA. And here comes the horrible thing. 
our little survivors can pick up this information. They can pick up the DNA. And now they can become resistant against the other stuff. They can build a shield. They can use a different pathway. They can also produce something that kills the old, uh, the old antibiotic. What have we got now? We now have bacteria that are resistant against the old antibiotic and the new one. We don't have any antibiotics left. It is literally something hitting the fan. And that is not good. Because if we don't have any antibiotics left, it is like, you know, like before penicillin was invented. Penicillin is actually an antibiotic that is inactivated by the release of something that destroys it. Most bacteria nowadays are resistant against penicillin. Most bacteria are now resistant against at least three or four different antibiotics. For some bacteria, we have reached the last line of defense. We may have one antibiotic left. But with this one antibiotic left, we have to be very, very careful because there might be bacteria out there like this one that are already naturally resistant against it because they've modified something. If we use this last antibiotic, what we will get is more and more of these bacteria that already are resistant because we have the natural selection. And they are already resistant against everything else. It's a little bit like when this happens, you are standing naked in front of a machine gun. Not a terribly nice thought, if you ask me. Any questions? These are your four scenarios. Come up with some ideas how you translate that. The company that I told you about, Recombinant Films, at the beginning, want to make a film about how bacteria become resistant. If you choose this scenario, <coughs> there is a chance that we will use your work to convince this company to do a collaboration with us. Wouldn't that be cool? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I hope you have fun. A round of